Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, good day, good morning, wherever you might be. So I'm uh, Marcus Thompson. I'm pretty much retired from private equity these days. I, I, when I accepted the invitation, I thought I'd be able to say I'd fully retired, but uh, the closing of the sale or the final investment of the final fund has been delayed. So I'm not quite there yet, but uh, in private equity, you get used to dealing with the, the unexpected. Um, so just talking about my, my career in private equity, uh, I um, am a lawyer by, uh, by qualification. I read law at university and I qualified, in fact, as a barrister in London, but I never actually practiced. I was more interested in business and I was offered a position with the Swire Group in 1984. And which I grabbed, and I found myself in Hong Kong uh, in October 1984 as a management trainee for Swire, working for the for working for Cathay Pacific, which is obviously, as you know, uh, owned by Swire. Um, so I worked in Cathay Cathay's IT department for about 18 months, and then I was posted to uh, Thailand, uh, Bangkok, in the sales marketing office, and I also spent a similar amount of time in Indonesia in the Jakarta office. Uh, was, I had an enormous amount of fun, but I realized that I was more interested in finance. And uh, so I decided to leave Swire. Initially, I thought I was going to take a, uh, I wouldn't be able to make the transition into finance directly. So I set about uh, applying for an MBA program. But whilst I was doing that, I also talked to a few private equity firms. And in fact, I, was, I got my timing right because it was the late eighties and private equity was booming, as you'll see in uh, my slides. And so they were really looking for all people, um, uh, very, very hiring very ag aggressively. So I managed to get myself a job. I started in 1988, March, with the Prue's private equity arm, that's the UK Prudential, which was um, known in those days as Britain's biggest institutional investor. And I stayed in with the Prue in London for uh, four years until 1992 as a kind of um, junior member of the team, working on uh, a mixture of deals, uh, some buyouts, some growth capital deals, and even some venture deals. So the Prue had a, a broad portfolio, and uh, it was a great experience. I mean, funnily enough, our business at the Prue was overseen by the um, assistant, the chairman, uh, none other than uh, Mark Tucker who is currently chairman of HSBC and previously was the CEO of uh, AIA Group. They had a great team there. Um, well, the UK economy went into recession in the early 90s and the pace of deal making slowed down. So I took the opportunity to explore opportunities in, in Asia because uh, at that time the dragon economies of Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea and Taiwan were riding high. And I met a gentleman called David Patterson who had set up the private equity arm of HSBC a few years earlier. And he just raised a fund and pretty much offered me a position um, on the spot. So I resigned from the Prue and joined the private equity arm of HSBC in 1992. And HVF Capital Partners, which is the company I work for today, is still the same uh, corporate entity. We've gone through a few name changes along the way. Uh, so that concludes, I've been in the industry for 36 years. 32 years of which have been in Asia. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of change, not only in the industry as a whole, but also uh, in, in, in Asia too. My presentation today is gonna to cover five topics. The development of the private equity industry over the past uh, four plus decades, the returns generated by private equity funds, a comparison of those returns with public equity returns, from which we all discovered that private equity has consistently outperformed public equity during, the, during its four decade plus life. And then we'll try to understand how this outperformance, sorry, this outperformance <laughs> has come about and finally drill down into some factors to consider when making private investments. So this slide shows the movement of interest rates and buyout deal activities during the past 40 plus years. And I'll use the same slide as a backdrop to look at the evolution of the private equity industry throughout this period. So starting with the 80s, uh, this period was really when the industry got going after Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Fed, finally managed to tame inflation and interest rates started to decline. Economic activity picked up and conglomerates 
uh, started to sell off non-core business activities to become more focused corporate entities. And the arrival of cash flow lending provided rich pickings for the nascent PE industry, which saw funds under management rise almost 10 times during the decade. Many of today's prominent firms were founded in the 1980s. They all reached a frothy head in 1989 with RJR, uh, sorry, with KKR's $25 billion acquisition of RJR Nabisco, the story of which subsequently became a bestseller and a hit movie. Uh, and the 80s also witnessed the introduction of the PC, and that triggered a wave of uh, activity in the VC sector. So if you recall, I started my career in 1998, sorry, 1988, which, as you can see, in the, uh, was the beginning of um, the end of the first mini boom in, in the 80s. So by the time the by the late 80s, the economy had become quite hot and the Fed stepped in to cool things down by raising interest rates back up to over 10 percent and thereby inducing a recession in the early 1990s. Many late 80s deals broke their banking covenants, others went bust, and it was quite a tough time for the industry. Uh, and I was lived through that period during the first uh, 1990, 1992, before I uh, decided to leave and uh, move to Asia. The, uh, the shakeout, sorry, the downturn triggered quite a shakeout in, in the industry. Uh, and the firms that survived became a lot more sophisticated. And the second half of the 90s saw the economy pick up and foster another private equity boom. We saw funds on management rising from a few tens of billions to several hundred billion dollars. And on the VC side, the 90s was, of course, when the internet became ubiquitous, which laid the ground for the first tech boom. The 2000s started with the bursting of the so-called dot-com bubble, and the Nasdaq fell 80%, and the Standard Poor's fell by close to 50%. Uh, the downturn forced yet another shakeout in the private equity and VC industries, with investors becoming a lot more thorough, and LPAs, the limited partnership agreements, becoming a lot more investor-friendly, while PE firms became more disciplined and focused. And while the first few years the noughties were quite slow, the second half brought much improved economic conditions, strong capital markets, and another private equity boom, with funds and management increasing from around 100 billion in 2003 to close to 700 billion by 2008. On the venture side, there was a huge hollowing out uh, post the dot com bust. Firms raised smaller funds and became more focused on the widening opportunity set created by the, by the internet. But this time, it was the property market's turn to form a bubble, fueled by the subprime mortgage, which hit the skids with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, triggering the global financial crisis. Meanwhile, in Asia, the private equity market had been somewhat slow at the start, uh, primarily because of the lack of any significant M&A market. And that was the most noticeable thing I realized when I arrived in Asia. Most of the deals were essentially pre-IPO deals rather than uh, buyouts or control deals. Um, after the Asian financial crisis, that changed. Uh, and um, we saw the beginnings of an M&A market, and that led to the arrival of a number of US and European firms into the market. However, it wasn't long before the dot-com bust came along. And that was followed by SARS. So it really was only in 2004 that the Asian private equity market started to take off. And it blossomed on the back of the private sector reforms in China at the time, as well as the burgeoning M&A market across several markets in Asia, notably um, South Korea. Uh, looking back, the 2004 to 2007 era is often referred to as the golden era, since the market witnessed some spectacularly successful China IPOs, such as Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and others. And sh but shortly afterwards, the global financial crisis dragged down the pace of deal-making and the private equity industry faced another downturn. So concerns expressed by many observers as to how the private equity industry would fare during the financial crisis. However, several respected academic studies concluded that in fact, private equity backed companies actually fared better during the crisis than non p backed companies because their sponsor connections and their superior ability to renegotiate debt packages and manage cash flow. By 2010, the economy was beginning to improve, 
and private equity roared back to life with the industry becoming more focused than ever on creating resilience in portfolio companies by adopting ESG strategies and seeking to create value in multiple different ways. For the first time, competition really became quite intense and conditions became tougher as acquisition multiples rose and bids were won by those firms bold enough to have confidence in executing aggressive growth plans for their acquisition targets. On the VC side, uh, business back, back as digitizations took took hold more generally. In Asia, uh, the market went through a period of consolidation. Uh, M&A activity retreated, the um, IPO markets were, were quiet. By 2014, however, the IPO markets are fully reopened and the market got going again. But after the election of Donald Trump in 2017, geopolitical tension surfaced and the market conditions became a lot more uh, challenging. The 2020s started with the COVID pandemic, which was followed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, return of inflation, higher interest rates and rising geopolitical tension. It's therefore no surprise that private equity activity dropped substantially, although the tech sector has now rebounded somewhat. Expectations are for interest rates to trend downwards and economic growth to pick up, which will be positive for the market. On the other hand, geopolitical tensions continue. In Asia, much will hinge on the reopening of the Hong Kong and Chinese IPO markets, as there are large numbers of private companies seeking to list their shares. So the next part of my presentation is going to be about uh, private equity returns. And as you'll see from this slide, the one interesting statistic is that at the pooled level, and whether you're talking about US private equity or global private equity, there's never been a vintage, a negative vintage year for private equity. Returns have been in the 10 to 20% IRR range, which is pretty respectable if you consider uh, the returns on, on public equity. VC returns were phenomenal until the late 1990s. Uh, some funds in 1996 succeeded IRRs of over 100%. But obviously, uh, when the dot-com crisis came along, those numbers got crushed. And uh, the vintage years, 1998, 1999, 2000, were all um, very tough for VC. USB returns, as you can see, were also impacted by some tech style drift, um, as you can see on the right-hand side of the chart. The post 2000, despite the two downturns during this period, private equity returns continued to perform well and held up remarkably well during the uh, during this period, generating IRRs in the 10 to 20 percent range. Venture returns took some time to recover, but post the, the global financial crisis have also been pretty strong. Turning to Asia, as for the US, Asian private equity returns at the pool level have been consistently positive. Fund vintage returns between 1999 and 2004 were particularly strong, although subsequent uh, years between 2005 and 2010 were disappointing because of a large a lot of capital was raised. I should say too much capital was raised on the back of the initial strong performance in Asia. In the early noughties, as we look back at it now, it's fondly referred to as the golden era of private equity in Asia. Since 2010, Asian returns have recovered, although they remain at slightly lower level than US and European returns. And going forward, Asian private equity returns will largely hinge on the capital markets opening up again, since a large proportion of private equity in Asia is invested in minority positions, particularly in China, which require buoyant capital markets to achieve good exits. So I'm not going to compare private equity returns with uh, with public equity returns. And the first thing to notice is the relative volatility of public equity markets, particularly Asian stock markets. In fact, while Asian stock markets outperformed global markets between 1997 and the global financial crisis, they've underperformed ever since. This chart shows the annual return on the MSCI All World Index. And as you can see, performance varies enormously. So it's no surprise why private equity has become popular with so many long-term investors. But how do you do an apples with apples comparison? Well, Cambridge Associates, <clears throat> which is a long-established and prominent investment consulting firm based in Boston, 
have developed a methodology called Modified Public Market Equivalent, or MPME. And MPME essentially mimics the cash flows of private equity funds by buying and selling the index. And using this tool, we can see the private equity returns about perform public equity returns at the index level. The delta between private equity and public returns is referred to in the industry as value add, which according to Cambridge Associates runs between five and 15 cent per annum in IRR terms. So the next question is how have private equity firms achieved these superior returns? You know, what is the, the secret source? I'd say the private equity process is a very disciplined one um, and thorough one too. It involves the preparation of a business plan or value creation plan on the target asset, which is thoroughly scrutinized and challenged at multiple levels by the private equity firm and a fleet of consultants. The plan becomes the base upon which the projected returns are calculated, debt and equity financing split is agreed if debt is being used, and the value of the bid is determined. Of course, attractive financial incentives are built into management, typically linked to exit value. Assuming the bid is successful, then the private equity firm will assemble a relatively small board with typically fewer than 10 people, which will include members of the management team, members of the private equity firm, and uh, typically a number of external board members who are industry veterans or industry experts. Boards would meet typically on a monthly basis uh, and be very focused on driving through the short and long-term goals which were developed in the venture in the value creation plan. Exit timing uh, will be driven by external factors such as sector multiples and internal factors such as the corporate company's, company's performance. So that's really it. It's a, due, a disciplined due diligence process, realistic value creation plan, focused for attention and experience in managing exit dynamics. I sourced this slide and the next one from Bain and Company, who do a lot of work for private equity firms around the world. And Bain have identified that the top performing firms, i.e. those in the top quartile, rely much more on margin and revenue expansion, i.e. by adding value to the portfolio company, as opposed to multiple expansion, which is driven by external market factors. As you can see, the, uh, the performance of, uh, or, or rather the, um, yes, the proportion of value created by the top quartile firms has been a lot more. And value add comes in many forms these days. It's not merely a function of strategy and finance or perhaps some not, um, add on M&A, uh, but it's multiple things. It's innovation design, it's uh, AI, ESG, um, multiple factors uh, come into play and all these will be looked at by private equity firm when uh, sizing up uh, a target. At the individual investment level, um, what I would say are the key sex factors are, if you're investing, know your patch, um, find long-term growth markets, and back the right management team who got a high degree of paranoia have risk sensitivity and are action oriented. Uh, generally, we have had poor experience in dealing with macro headwinds. So look out for favorable tailwinds of one form or the other and come up uh, with devised and execute value add strategies and stay disciplined during every stage of the day, game. Don't get carried away and wait for the time for the exit to uh, the best, the most opportune time to uh, generate an exit. So that concludes my presentation and I've uh, been very happy to answer any questions you may have on what I've covered during this uh, presentation or, or any other matter of that matter related to private equity. Thank you. Excellent. So, so let me start uh, by shooting off a few uh, questions here. So, when you look back over these uh, thirty plus years in the industry, what uh, have been the biggest changes? Is there something you would like to highlight there? 
I think the um, industry has become a lot more, uh, I mean, I was going to say sophisticated, but uh, I, I want to elaborate what I mean by that. It, uh, whereas in the early days, we were doing essentially financial due diligence and some legal due diligence. We were just looking at the, the company at quite a simple level. These days, if you're sizing up a target, you're going to be looking at many more aspects uh, to the business. The you know, what it's, for example, it's uh, HR policies, it's ESG policies, um, it's digital strategies. Um, it's become a lot more of a complex game, um, which raises the risks and the rewards. And I think, you know, in that slide that Bain showed. Uh, it, it, I think as the conditions get tough, the the, the tough get going, um, and so I think that's the biggest change. If I look from start to finish, where it was uh, from today, and where sorry, yeah, where it was when I started, and where it is today. And if you do a, a bit of a forward-looking uh, forecast, if you look ahead, let's say the next ten years, what would you expect the biggest changes to be in the peanut industry? Yeah, more of the same, really. Uh, I think we're moving into an era. I mean, you, you've seen the we've seen the impact of first it was the personal computers, right? In the in the eighties, in the nineties it was the internet, and in the two thousands it was kind of uh, broadening out that internet. And now we're moving into the era of AI. Uh, and there's no doubt about it that AI is going to have a huge impact on businesses, whatever they're doing. And, you know, if you're not thinking through, you don't have an AI strategy in mind, uh, you know, you, you better get it going because otherwise you're going to be left behind. Um, and you've always got to be, think, think about private equity is it's a long-term game. You, you know, we, we spend too much time just looking at what is in, immediately in front of us, and not enough time looking at, what we think is going to happen for the next three, four, five, six, seven, ten years. So every now and again, it's it's a good discipline to step back and think through, you know, where are things going to be in in five or ten years' time? I can't. I mean, I can't give you an outlook on the interest rates, for example, <laughs> and capital markets. I don't want to try and do that. Yeah, you know, those will uh, those will unfold as they unfold. But so the external factors, you know, you can't really control. But the ones you can control within companies, those are the ones that you need to be focused on. Hmm. Um, looking at all the investments you have been involved in, can we start by talking a bit about the best one that you um, have under your belt and why it was a success? Later, by the way, I would like to hear about your worst one too. So, But let's start with the best one. <laughs> why was it a bit okay. and, and why well, was it a success? Yeah, so so hard hard to make a single choice, uh, given, given that um, there's more than one successful investment. Uh, I'm pleased to say, but I think it's it, you know when I talked about key, when I talked about key success factors, macro tailwinds. Um, we invested in a supermarket chain in China called uh, Yongwei, which is now listed on the Shanghai Stock Exchange, and. At first glance, it looked it was trying to compete against Carrefour and Walmart, and a lot of uh, people sort of said, "Well, that's you know, good luck, good luck to you, Yongwei." But actually, Yongwei had invested in the downstream sourcing of fresh produce, and uh, in China, fresh produce drives foot traffic. People go shopping every day to buy their uh, their, their food, and um, we, we we thought, okay, well, this is interesting because they are able to source fresh produce at better quality because they're actually buying direct from the farms and at cheaper prices. And therefore, they can undercut Walmart and uh, Carrefour, who were the giants at the time, in that area. Of course, they couldn't undercut on the you know, the, the, the other uh, hardware and stuff because uh, they didn't have the scale of um, um, purchase. So... Then there was a question of understanding, um, you know, what were the best ways to maximize that uh, that uh, that flow, 
Um, we, you know, by interacting with management, we realized that we had found a, a great management team who were really innovative, uh, always prepared to uh, try change um, if they if they thought something could be improved. Super energetic, um, and yeah, sure enough, you know, we put some money in. The company was able to use that capital to roll out uh, stores across. Nishti, Fujian province, but then into other provinces around China. And now it's one of the largest um, supermarket players um, in, in China. So that's a good story. Um, uh, but it, it really points to these factors, right? You, 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 you want tailwinds, you want a great management team, uh, and you want to be able to identify some value-added uh, strategies. You know, why is it different? And why, why is it going to succeed? Okay, you, you've already given me the heads up on the ones that uh, didn't. <laughs> okay, well, clearly uh, a lot of the opposite supply in the case of you know a bad investment. Um, I mean, we you know we've had investments where the management team we thought were good turned out to be uh, poor and sometimes even crooked. Actually, you know where they kind of stole money, uh, and that's a very hard dynamic to to deal with. Uh, and other times we've had you know good good quality management teams, but you know we faced a, a really tough industry. We had investment in the forestry sector in Indonesia, which got clobbered by um, the the currency downturn and uh, rising interest rates and so forth. So yeah, that was a question of sort of facing uh, headwinds as opposed to actually having tailwinds behind you, even though you actually had a, a decent management team. So, yeah, in a nutshell, it, it's, it's those factors that I mentioned. So, you know. Okay, no, I think that's uh, interesting uh, to hear about. Um, usually people all, all always talk about uh, the successes, but not really share about the uh, failures as well. And sometimes those are the ones you can learn the most from, right? Yeah, we, we did um, a number of, kind of lessons learned. Um, something which we picked up, we had investment in the oil, oil and gas industry. And, you, you know, if you have an instant in, in the oil and gas industry, there is a kind of uh, roots cause analysis you know, what went wrong and you know, lessons learned, things get improved. And yeah, I think it's, you've got to learn from your mistakes. It's sometimes it's painful to actually uh, face, you know, look, look at what happened and, and scrub it and realize uh, that, you know, mistakes were made, ju judgments were wrong judgments to take them. But it is a worthwhile exercise too from time to time. Yeah. I mean, going through your slides before, over the last few decades, there have been many things changing. There have been multiple crises. And um, one question I have for you is, um, can you give us an example of a crisis that, that you have been or you were directly exposed to, when the crisis actually at the end turned out to be a blessing because it was an opportunity for you and your firm to come across maybe very good assets at low prices or something, but give me sort of the good aspect of the crisis you have uh, seen. Yeah, no, you know, uh, great question. So, one of, we we'd been um, we raised new fund in nineteen ninety five and uh, wanted to uh, explore the market opportunity in South Korea, which had been essentially close to foreign investors, uh, sort of differential pricing between local shares and foreign shares. But yet, you know, South Korea was really interesting from a business perspective because there are a number of companies which were uh, well run, making um, successful in exporting. So, you know, we had a series of meetings in, up in the run up to the global financial crisis with Korean companies, but we can never actually agree any terms because their expectations on pricing were always too high and uh, they felt they, you know, we should pay a foreign premium. Of course, you know, when the crisis came along in, in 1998, uh, what the Koreans call the IMF crisis, um, 
things all changed all of a sudden um doors were opened that there was no more talk of a foreign investor discount a, a premium and we were able to cut some deals and during that period we we closed a number of deals which turned out to be very successful investments for us because we were able to get in to some really great quality companies um, at attractive prices and ride the recovery which occurred uh fairly soon after in, in the early 2000s so yes i mean crisis is is definitely uh opportunity uh danger and opportunity and grab the opportunity part of that so um when it comes to investment fads um can you give us examples of things that you have seen in the past and maybe you uh, were taking part in those as well but it all turned out to be not um something profitable really um but everyone was sort of going in the same direction and it was uh, maybe difficult to resist yeah no i mean the the big one was the tech uh, boom i mean the internet bubble right where uh, opportunities were coming you know we had a private equity fund but yet we were being presented with wonderful internet investment opportunities and um you know, a number of firms in the US, as we saw, sort of got seduced by the attractions of, of the tech sector. Um, a number of firms went out of business because of investments which went wrong in the early 2000s. I don't say we had a you know completely clean sheet, sheet there. We did make a couple of small investments in, in companies which had sort of internet business models, which you know we overpaid for, and then they went wrong. We had to write them off. Um, but by and large, we, we stuck, stick, stuck to our knitting. But it did that period did uh, what 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 we did as a firm though was to separate out venture from private equity. Said, okay, well look, we're going to create a new business activity called venture investing, and we're going to raise a, a venture fund which will invest in venture opportunities. Of course, that took quite a long time to actually get off the ground. So, uh, which was <laughs> turned out to be a blessing because we, you know, otherwise it would have been fully invested in kind of two thousand and then. Uh, come 2001, 2002, it would have been uh, a very source, a very poor site. So, um, the yeah, fad investing is something. It, it kind of can be at the time very hard to stay uh, fully disciplined to the um, to you know, whatever is the fad at the moment. I mean, I saw a graph the other day of a company called Cisco Systems, which in the late 90s was the equivalent of NVIDIA. Uh, it was kind of the stock play. It was the kind of picks and, picks and spades way to play the internet bubble. And I mean, it went right up through the roof, okay? Um, people don't talk about Cisco systems today. It's still there, still makes uh, decent routers and equipment, but its stock price has come back to earth and it never, you know, it sort of went up just up like this and right down. So the question is, um, as competition set in, other manufacturers uh, came in and were able to compete with Cisco with equivalent quality at a, at a lower price. Um, Cisco's margins got eroded and it became essentially a commodity product. So, you know, I think if you're looking at NVIDIA uh, as a stock, you need to kind of think through whether there are any um, parallels between you know, what happened uh, with Cisco and, you know, where NVIDIA is. Of course, I you know I've I've heard stories that Nvidia is is only trading on twenty thirty times not uh, P whatever was Cisco was some sort of ten times further but nevertheless uh, you know I think you know you want to be a little bit careful how long you want to hold that stock for. So when you look back at um, the different investment themes during these different eras that have actually worked out for you and your firm, um, have there been any particular common denominators among those themes that you can point to and say, for example, they all turn out great because they have a big addressable market or and they um, benefited from some technological revolution at the time, or is there any common denominator between those themes? Yeah, so I mean, for, for our firm, we were a middle market and focused on more control deals. Um, I mean, that, that was an evolution that occurred. We sort of split our venture business off separately, so that went a different way. Um, and we found there was a, a great market for 
family succession driven buyouts um, where the founding family um, built up a great business, but for whatever reason, either they don't have kids or kids aren't interested in taking over the business, whatever it might be. Um, and they want to monetize kind of uh, a life's work. And private equity is an interesting solution to them because uh, these companies, you know, if you've been competing against a raft of com com your competitors, you know, you, you it's quite difficult emotionally to bring yourselves to have a conversation <laughs> with one of these competitors about selling out, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So private equity becomes a much more powerful alternative where you can actually sell control and you can monetize your lifetime. So you can even retain a stake in the business um, and and take it uh, for, ne for next level. So we had some particularly successful deals uh, on, uh, on, on family succession. Um, and the other... The sector which you know we like, and this is not so much talking about China because China had its own issues, but education is is one of those areas that is um, for Asian families uh, is a very high priority uh, spend item, and it's one where you know people always want to try and pay for the best. So there's an opportunity to create sort of good margins. I think um, there have been a number of successful investments in the education sector across uh, the private equity space. We had a couple uh, which did very well, and a number of other private equity firms uh, invested successfully in education. Of course, you know I, I'm very conscious of what the change in regulations occurred in, in China, which kind of um, spoiled that story somewhat, but uh, uh, specifically in China, but otherwise in in other markets. I think it's a particularly attractive um, sec long-term sector. So if we, since you mentioned China, um, any views on where China is today and, and uh, the attractiveness of investing there, given recent headwinds and regulatory changes and what have you? Yeah, so I, I'm I'm not really a China expert. And sitting here with Benson, you, you should probably ask that um, <laughs> question to him. But... <laughs> Yeah, he will get the chance to, yeah. in a few minutes. Yeah, I mean, I have, I you know, I have in my presentation, I alluded to the fact that the bulk of deals in China are minority deals, post uh, control deals, right? So, yeah. the likely exit route for most of those deals is going to be the IPO. So, a lot hinges on the capital markets, and I, you know, I mean, you can take your view on that. I mean, I saw there was a a, a report published by Deloitte, which is uh, hoping, you know, which suggests that the outlook is promising. And there'll be uh, many more IPOs coming uh, forward for Hong Kong in the next uh, few years. So, so hard to say. Um, I mean, China remains a, a huge market. It has um, tremendous uh, corporate talent, um, great management teams, innovation. It's all there in spades. Uh, it, it's really just a question of um, sort of macroeconomic conditions improving somewhat to allow capital markets to reopen and, and exits to come about. But, um, you know, no doubt Benson will have some more to say on that too. Yeah, I think, yeah, Benson, if you can maybe share some of your, thought, uh, some of your thoughts, that would be great. This is a perfect segue. Um, please. Yeah, wow. Um, wow, thank you, um, Marcus. Um, let me make it very simple because we don't have a lot of time. The way I look at uh, picking investments right now, the biggest theme, of course, right now is technology. Uh, it's been ongoing ever since the 90s. And to my mind, a lot of people think it's been 30 years. So is it a little bit long on the teeth? That we're not even close. I think AI is only the latest... Um, Thing that has gone into the public's consciousness. Whereas as we look at technology, it's just exploding on a daily basis. So uh, my main theme, number one, is technology, which then leads to why China? Because if you think about technology right now in the world, it's basically G2, which is you either invest in US or you invest in China. That's it. Um, that's the two biggest technology sort of uh, emergence emerging market, technology emerging market in the world. It's either US and China. For me, you know, I have 
comparative advantage in China. I have no comparative advantage in the US, so that's why I picked China. Um, I'm sure there are the other people who will pick the US. I, I, I don't think it's a uh, right or wrong. It's just uh, where can you have your, as you, you know, Marcus, where is your patch? My patch is China. So technology number one, China number two. Within China, the way, you know, having been covering it for 30 years, I think the two things that, that I leverage on in China, number one is the scale of China is phenomenal. Just phenomenal. You can do a restaurant well, and you can be, you know, you can make an amazing amount of money. You can have the, you know, 30 of the same restaurant in the, in the in one city, and then there's uh, 300 cities around in China. So it's just mind boggling. So scale is one of them. So I look for things that really can scale across China. The other thing is more strange. Um, it is the fact that China is always from, it's very, very volatile, from super, super um, optimistic to super, super pessimistic. It goes, the pendulum always swings too much in both ways. This volatility a lot of people hate, I love. Because you will have mispricing and where the public consensus is wrong. And it's very interesting when you're at the bottom, everything, everyone believes the bottom is there forever. It never is. It always comes back up. Just like the frenzy will always come back down. And that is the moment, what I call the tipping point, that is where the, um, the truly opportunities can come through, the volatility. Now, I want to add, uh, uh, finish off a little bit because people, you asked me about China and people always say volatility is a bad thing, so therefore don't go into China. I said, no, volatility is exactly how you get alpha and betas and whatever, okay? If you can pick that, then you'll be in good shape. Why is the Chinese government, so to speak, so incapable to smoothen the volatility? It bugged me ever since I went to China from 1992. Uh, and I said, frankly, Chinese governments are very good at governing. I don't know why they allow this to do it. Until probably about two years ago, I found the answer, Marcus which is an engineering answer, which is <laughs> with such a big scale country, imagine you have so many moving parts, right? How do you get it from one equilibrium to the next very fast? In engineering speak, we said, you don't go smoothly like that. That takes forever. And the bigger this, the longer is that curve. Instead, what you do is what we do, we call give it a big bump so that it overshoots very quickly and then comes back down, just like a pendulum. And if you look at the, uh, the equation of a pendulum, that's the fastest way to equilibrium, to the new equilibrium. So that's what the Chinese are doing. So you'll find that um, they always go too much in one direction and then, and then fast correct, correct, just like the end of COVID. One day, we're all locked down. Next day, we're all open. That's a very typical Chinese way of managing. And then it'll let it just flow it like that. So I guess the last point is probably the thing that a lot of people uh, never really thought about, which is that volatility is your friend in China. So that's how I look at it. And um, for me, because technology only has China and U.S., and China is my comparative advantage. I therefore, um, and and scale is always there. Everybody sees it. And volatility is the one that nobody realizes. So that's why China tech volatility is where I find the most value. Yeah. Thank you, Benson. Yeah. Uh, in so the meantime, uh, I will come back to you a bit later on. So please stay online. Um, I have uh, <clears throat> a couple of questions from the audience uh, that I would like to read out. I believe they are um, directed towards um, Marcus. Uh, the first uh, question is, uh, why is being paranoid one of the key success factors for an existing management team? 
Okay, so being paranoid really, um, by that I mean having your eyes open, being sensitive to things that may not be immediately visible, right? Changes in the market, subtle changes in the market, which could have, uh, you know, initially on first blush, you think, oh, well, that's just, you know, just a movement of the market. But then if you dig deeper, you can find actually a kind of more significant impact. So by that, I mean, by paranoid, I, I mean, just don't sit there and be complacent that, hey, everything is great today and the sun's shining. Uh, it's going to be like that tomorrow uh, because that is often not the case. You need to be well prepared for changes in the market because the market is always changing. And sometimes those changes can go against you. That's really what I was alluding to in in, um, in terms of being uh, paranoid. Have keep your eyes open, ear to the ground, listen, find out what's going on, be engaged, fully engaged. Excellent. Good. No, thanks for that, Marcus. I have another one for you. And after that, I have a, a couple of questions I would like to ask to both of you to get your different perspectives. So, Marcus, another question for you here. Um, and that is, uh, given the current market conditions, such as growth expectations and geopolitics, uh, etc., what would be the top geographic markets you would be looking at? Top geographic? Well, I specific countries I, I, yeah okay so i mean the ones off the top of my head would be from a geopolitical point of view would be um india and vietnam right i mean uh it, uh, vietnam because of its um man largely because of its manufacturing base it doesn't really compete doesn't have the uh, supply infrastructure yet that china has but at certain levels it can pick up some business, some lower end business uh, from uh, from China, um, and India for the same reason that, uh, particularly at the services side, India can benefit from um, capital flows that might otherwise go towards China, you know, to going towards uh, to India. I think you're seeing that in the performance of both those uh, local markets. They sort of decoupled somewhat. Um, those would be my my top picks. I mean, China is its its own market, and it will go its own way. Uh, and you know, Benson has talked about you know the opportunity set there, which you know remains uh, enormous. I'm more looking at it from an external point of view in terms of you know kind of U.S. investment where that might flow. Uh, and I'm you know, thinking, looking at it and saying, okay, well, Vietnam and India are probably the top choices for sort of US corporates or investors. Excellent. Um, so here comes a question for both of you. I will let you, Marcus, answer first. Um, have you had any mentors during your career? And if so, what was the most important takeaway that they shared with you during your your journey, your career? Yeah, so I've had a number of mentors. I'm not sure any of them were kind of officially classified as mentors, <laughs> uh, but they were people I worked with um, when I was at the Pru in London, particularly in those early days, and who showed me kind of the how, you know, how to build financial models. I mean, simple stuff: how to build financial models, how to um, read financial statements, you know, how to look out for issues in balance sheets. Um, these kind of, you know, even though I'm not qualified as an accountant, you know, as an investor, you need to be able to pick up a set of accounts and look through it and just check check them out, right, as to whether they they look in good shape or or or, or otherwise. Um, then there've been other so there's some kind of knots and bolts when I was at, at a junior level. Then I've had other mentors as I became um, more front forward facing. Just watching people engage interpersonal skills, uh, something we're not really taught very taught at. So at university, it's all about exams and writing, uh, but the verbal part of communications, as we all know, is, uh, is important and actually becoming increasingly important. So 
yeah, a number of people who I believe are excellent and, you know, I've watched them present and uh, and uh, taken some lessons away to try and improve my own uh, personal presentation skills. So, yeah, yeah, no, no, no formal men mentors as such, but people who I've kind of watched and followed and respected. Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks for that. I think that still gives a, an idea. Uh, what about you, Benson? I'm sure you have had a few people who helped you and inspired you along the way. <laughs> yes. Um, the first one is actually the firm who took me into, you know, the whole private equity venture capital space, which was Hellman and Friedman. Um, uh, that's where I learned my trade, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And the two things I learned from that firm is number one, of course, you know, uh, in terms of deal doing, you know, all the investment banking, all the basic skills, uh, they are very, very good. Um, they do a lot of leverage buyouts, control deals, uh, management partnerships and all that. But uh, so it's it, purely in terms of techniques, I learn a lot. But more importantly than that, uh, the founder of the firm, uh, uh, the past uh, Hellman, told us that you are not really investing into companies. You are investing into the relationships, partnerships, and the leaderships of the CEO and his people around him. Not just the team, but the people, entire people around him. And that was the biggest takeaway that really helped me a lot in building long-term sort of uh, partnerships with CEO. So I would count him as one of them. The other one is uh, my, uh, not just my, I would say, entrepreneur, so the Kung Fu master, but he is also my wine Kung Fu master, which is Savio Kwan. So I've been very, very fortunate to have seen him in action uh, as he was the ex-COO of Alibaba, uh, basically doing his magic to, the, to transform the company in the early days. Uh, since uh, around 01 or 02. Um, and, uh, and I've had his, I would say, um, wisdom up to today. So I'll count the two of them as uh, my mentors, Johan. Thanks for that. So um, I have one final question. And um, yeah, once again, I will let Marcus go first, if you don't mind, Benson. Um, so, um, Marcus, what advice would you like to have given to a younger version of yourself? Imagine yourself being at university and you could speak as a father figure to yourself at that time. What, yeah. what would you advise? So I have to say that if my profile at the time I got into the private equity industry is probably not the profile that you know, I think private equity firms be looking for is essentially, you know, I just had three years of experience, um, and not even in finance either. Uh, the uh, I showed the slide um, illustrating the, uh, the 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 playbook, private equity playbook in terms of value add, and y you need to think through that. You need to think what investing is all about. These days, private equity was full of, I mean, so in the old days, it was full of generalists. Everyone did the same thing, right? And similar sort of profile of people. Uh, but these days, the private equity firms are much larger. You've got people who are involved in fundraising. You've got people who are involved in the sort of legal side. You've got people who are involved in cutting deals, um, building relationships with CEOs. You've got people who are involved in in post-investment uh, value creation. Uh, it, it's really, uh, there, are, there are actually many more opportunities today from a much broader range of backgrounds than there was you know, when I went into private equity. So I think it's a question of um, understanding you know, where your strengths are. And you know, if you're a sort of finance person through and through, then maybe you wanna sort of go for the deal job. On the other hand, if you think you have um, other skills, then maybe you should build up those skills 
and um, build up expertise in a particular area, which you then can then sell to a private equity firm. Because more and more of the, the playbook uh, areas are being brought in house. You know, if you're, if, for example, you know, you, you become an expert in AI, well, you know, maybe a private equity firm might be interested in hiring you one day because they'll, you know, they'll want to have somebody on their books who can understand say I can actually sit down with their portfolio companies and give them advice on how to build an AI strategy and how to implement it, for example. So I think there are, you know, when I joined, it, it was kind of fairly simple set of characteristics were required, but yeah. these days uh, it's a much bigger industry, much yeah. broader. You've, you've got a, you've got a, um, go with what you're good at. I mean, you you know you can't suddenly, you know, if you're a good finance person, you can't suddenly pretend that you're going to be a you know good at advising people on AI if you have no tech yeah. understanding, for example. So your answer was good, but quite generic. It, it, can you give me a version that was specifically tailored to you when you were young? What would you like to tell yourself? Oh, what would I like to tell myself back in yes. private equity? Yeah, so imagine Sorry, here we listen. are, Marcus Sr. giving uh, advice to Marcus uh, Jr., who is just uh, about to leave university. If you had that benefit <laughs> of, of time travel, what would you tell yourself? That would have helped you somehow in uh, being even more successful in your career or, or happier with your choices or anything yeah, like I that. Think I, yeah, no, I, it would be, be more forward thinking, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And uh, yes, yes, just be more forward thinking and more time thinking about how the future is likely to unfold and what those opportunities will bring. Um, yeah, that would be my single message. Excellent. Keep it to one. Perfect. So on that note, um, Benson, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm sure you have been thinking about this while the Marcus has been answering. So what would you have liked to tell a younger version of yourself? Um, I think to start with, everybody believes that venture capital private equity is a money game. I would tell my younger self that more than the money game, it is actually a people's game. Yeah. You source the best deal from the people. You get the experts from the people. And how you manage yourself, how you get to be trusted by others over the long term, your mannerism, your character, your integrity, that is the biggest, uh, I would say, a brain equity of myself. And it took me much longer than I ought to to get that people's game figured out. Okay. So I would also say, um, because we are at this stage, which is the next 20 years, clearly uh, it's also a technology game. The reason I say that is I don't care whether people know about it, but they need to be not fear it. If AI is there, go try ChatGBT. If the uh, iPhone is there, please be very conversant with it. The reason is that I think going forward in the next 20 years, what is this? What is the combination that would make an amazing company is, of course, the smartest people, okay? And then they have a lot of funding so that they can build machines. And I think it's a, it's a man-machine matrix that will make this management much more uh, exponential. So I think going forward now, if I say to them, I say, of course, you know the money game, you know, you're, you're in finance, of course, you know that, but please uh, think through what does it mean to be, to be the people's game? How do you play that? But more importantly is how does technology completely digitally transform every business model in the world? I think those three things will be the um um will be the dynamite, you know, the 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 uh, you know the nitrous oxygen or whatever you know, that will explode and create explosive companies. Yeah, the three games together. Yeah.
Thank you so much, uh, Benson. So thank we have you. come to an end, um, Marcus. Thank you so much. Any kind of departing words from from your side before we draw to a close? <laughs> well, no, you know, and thank you, Benson. Thank you. Uh, and um, yeah, no, it is private equity. Ultimately, is a people business. You're 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 backing people, right? And uh, that's uh, what what it's what it's ultimately what's what it's all about. Yeah, I would agree with that. So on that note, uh, thank you both, and thank you, Marcus, to you especially. I know you put in a lot of effort in preparing the slides and and what have you. My so uh, uh, very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Benson, too. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Marcus.